Oh, I can hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> there you go. I missed you. I missed you for a minute. Okay, no problem. I apologize. I just want to start out by saying we are 40 days away from one of the biggest decisions that Americans will face, and that is voting in the November 3rd election. Now, there is a lot on the line. And a lot of people are using their voices to get out the vote, including our very special guest that you see with me, actor Yvette Nicole Brown. You know her best from television and the movies. And tonight she's here to speak with us with her activist hat on. Welcome Yvette and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I know you're between taping of shows and we don't want you to be late for your real job, but first, let's start by talking about Tell our audience why you decided to get out, get involved with this When We All Vote campaign. You know, I'm terrified. I I, I watch the news. I'm seeing what's happening in the world and um, especially our nation. And I feel like anytime you've been given a platform, it's important to use it for good. Um, I don't think it's enough for me to talk to my followers on Twitter or Instagram about lip gloss and, and hair gel. I think yeah. it's important for us to talk about the things that actually affect us and affect um, our communities. And so um, I decided that if we, it, the only way we can get out of this is if everybody votes. And um, when we all vote is a great platform that is like a one-stop shop for all things voting. And I'm, I'm so honored to be an ambassador for them and to have opportunities to speak to you and, and those that are tuning in about how important it is to Make sure your voice is heard. You know, you could have picked any cause. Why this call? I know you called. You said you're terrified. But any other reason why getting out the vote, especially for this election coming up in November, why that's so crucial and important to you? Well, I know for sure that my ancestors died for this right. I don't take it um, lightly that they were fire hosed and dogs were attacking them so that they could make sure that the people that made decisions for them were who they chose. It's our right to choose who makes decisions for us, who governs us. And um, I think that the idea that, well, what's the point? It won't, nothing will change. Nothing will change if we don't fight for change. And our vote is the first line of defense um, for everything that's, that's going crazy to fix it. So we have to make sure that we take part. And I don't care if it's a presidential election or if it's local dog catcher, make sure that you have a say in who that person is. And we've seen too much to, to not think that what we want matters. It matters. It matters and it makes a difference. Now you're not the only celebrity of color who's using your voice and your influence to try to break through to undecided voters and to young people. Talk to me about how concerned are you about some uh, voters who maybe not taking this quite as seriously as they should this election cycle? Um. I, I'm shocked by it, and um, again, it scares me because I don't, I don't know what else needs to happen for them to realize that we are literally unable to leave our homes right now because the person in charge has not taken care of a pandemic. Yeah. We can't breathe the air outside of our homes. I don't know how you could need more than that. You know, we're seeing people killed in their in their homes and no charges being filed because someone that was elected doesn't seem to think that our lives matter even though they have the same skin tone as us. I don't know what else you need to see. To, I mean, and even if you don't believe that it works, why not just 
vote just to vote. That's my new stance. My new stance is, okay, maybe you don't think it works. Just vote anyway. Just vote anyway. Since it doesn't matter, just why not choose the other side of the not mattering? Instead of staying home, if it doesn't matter, just throw your vote a certain way and hope for the best. And hopefully they're voting the way we need them to vote. <laughs> I'm at the end of my, my rope. I don't know what else to say besides you guys have got to register and you've got to vote. Well, you know, and that is so important. And perhaps some of our young people hearing it from influencers like you, we are certainly hoping that that will make a difference. And of course, we want to encourage everybody that you can't just show up and vote, that you have to register first. And in many states, the uh, time and cutoff to register for the election is coming up soon. Yes, it is. So one last pitch. What would you say to vo voters of any age, of any color, to I get out there and do their civic duty? I would say that the first thing you should do is go to when we all vote and, and it's on Twitter, it's on Instagram, it's everywhere. It will tell you everything you need to know about how you register. And even if you are registered, check it because there, there's a lot of voter suppression going on and they're purging a lot of us from the voter roll. So make sure you go and, you know, make sure if you moved or something changed, make sure everything is, is, is there and just realize that when I think of people like uh, John Lewis and yes. I think of how his entire life was about the right to vote for us. He did that for us. When I think about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and how long she held on, she held on for us because she knew that this election was the most important election of most of our lifetimes. So please, 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 if you don't wanna do it for yourself, if you don't wanna do it for me, please do it for John Lewis and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Just register and, and vote, vote, and vote, and vote, vote, vote. And Yvette, I know you've got to run soon, but I do want to ask you one other question for yeah. the last few months, especially since George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis and there have been other countless senseless murders of black men and women since then. We saw people get out in the street to protest, black, white, brown together. We even saw people holding signs to say, get out and vote and register to vote. How concerned are you that the people who were caught up in that moment that movement, how concerned are you that they may or may not make it back to the polls, be as you know excited about protesting as they should be about voting? I think what they forget is that um, back in the 60s, they were protesting for the right to vote. Yes. Realize that. Sorry, that's my dog, Harley. Um, they were marching in the streets because they wanted to vote. So don't miss that. Don't miss that that was why they took to the streets. We have a thousand different reasons to take to the streets now, but our found our founding fathers, our founding civil rights founders and, 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 and women and men that cared about civil rights, they marched for us to be able to vote. And can I say one other thing? Yes, um, please. It's also important for you to fin fill out your census, uh, guys. Your census decides, when we're counted in the census, it decides how much money comes to our community. So if there's something missing in your community, if there's money missing from your community, the census fix th fixes that. So we have until September 30th, please mm -hmm. go online to the Census Bureau and fill out. Now listen, it's, it's private, nobody knows what your name is, well, they just need to count the heads in that house. So please make sure you're counted, make sure you're registered to vote and yeah. please, please, please vote and make your voting plan. It's not enough to just say, I'm gonna vote on November 3rd. Decide if you're gonna vote early, decide if you're gonna do mail-in vote, have a, have a contingency plan if something goes wrong. If you have a flat tire, what you gonna do? Pack a sandwich, make your plan now because your vote matters. We need your and vote. And another thing to add to that plan, if you're already a registered voter, go online in your state to make sure your polling place hasn't changed Come on. and that you are still on the roll, that you have Come not on. been purged in case your name is not there. You still have time to try to get that straightened out and can even That's do right. a provisional ballot. So there's right. so many things to get it done right that no excuses. So thank okay. you so much, Yvette, for thank joining you. us tonight. And keep up all the great work that you're doing for I when will. we all vote. We certainly appreciate you and all the other celebrities who are lending their voice and their talent and their influence to getting our folks to the polls. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Lena. It was an honor.
what they did, what we need to do. We've come too far to turn around, honor our past, vote for our future. Welcome to the second in a town hall series, Surviving, Mobilizing, and Thriving in the New South. In tonight's broadcast, we focus on politics, faith, and media, harnessing the collective power of when we all vote. Brought to you by the Southern Area of the Lynx Incorporated. Good evening and welcome. My name is Sylvia Perry and I serve as the Southern Area Director of the Lynx Incorporated. Welcome to Surviving, Thriving, and Mobilizing in the New South, Politics, Faith, and Media. Harnessing the collective power of when we all vote. Tonight is the second in a series of virtual town hall meetings designed to enlighten, empower, and engage the public for a time such as this. This evening, you're going to hear from three leading men at the top of their game in their respective fields. Veteran talk show host and journalist, Roland Martin, faith leader and civil rights activist, Dr. William Barber, and House Majority Whip, and the highest ranking man of color in elected politics, Congressman Jim Clyburn. You will also hear from some of our best and brightest leaders elected by you, our Southern mayors, proven testaments that our votes make a difference. At the conclusion, you will hear from our series curator, Dr. Deborah Thomas, who will provide additional information on taking our mobilization efforts to the next level. We are at a critical time in America. When it comes to the November election, no, we need you. Your children need you. And those yet unborn need you to stand up, not sit down, speak up, not shut up, and run to the polls while taking someone with you. We can do this. And the path to mobilization, it starts right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so pleased to present to you our esteemed guest of Mobilizing in the New South, hosted by Emmy-winning journalist, Melina Cunningham Anderson. Hi, I'm Vi Lyles, mayor of the city of Charlotte, the 15th largest city in the country. But I'm not here to talk about the size of our city. I'm talking about the size of our voting capacity. We need you to get out and vote. Make a plan to vote. Whether you vote early, whether you vote absentee, have a plan. And then once you have that plan, make sure your family and friends understand that they too can vote. It's going to take all of us to make a difference in this country. And the number one difference that we have, the power that we have, is by voting. Now, November 3rd is not too far away, please, exercise your right, your power, and- vote. Hello everyone, I am Randall Woodfin, the 30th mayor of Birmingham, Alabama, a city whose name is carved permanently in American history. Just as we fought for change over 50 years ago, the struggle remains. Now we fight through the ballot box. I encourage you to reflect on the accomplishments we have made over the past decades and challenge you to continue. My election, my city and my state are all testament that your vote counts. Please vote November. Thank you to Sylvia Perry, our Southern Area Director. And thank you, America, for joining us again. Welcome back to those of you who were with us for our first town hall meeting, Justice or Just Us. And welcome to those of you who are tuning in for the first time. So let's get started. Now, I want to say, if you do have a question for our guest tonight, please take the time now to type it in our chat box and we will get to it during the session. Our first guest, I see, is joined us now, has served South Carolina's 6th Congressional District since 1993. Currently, he is in his 14th term, and he is a two-term House Majority Whip and is known for being a leader, a voice, and a conscience for those he represents. We are honored to welcome Congressman Jim Clyburn. And Congressman Clyburn, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, I can hear you. 
I, I have to admit to you, I'm a South Carolina native, so it's an honor to be talking to you tonight. And I want to start out, first of all, with some breaking news that we've been hearing about in the last 24 hours. And it appears that even more, our democracy is at stake. And that is why it's so important to get the word out to vote. The president has declared... It declined to comment on a peaceful transition of power. And for months, he's planted the seed of a rigged election. Now, how do you, as a congressman, combat that noise and keep your constituents and all of us engaged in the voting process, whether by mail or in person? Well, thank you very much for having me this evening. Let me just say, first of all, I have been saying for months now, that this election is the most consequential presidential election of all of our lifetimes. Yes. In fact, I sincerely believe it is the most consequential since the presidential election of 1860. Simply because the consequences that flowed from that election, uh, 1860, it was Abraham Lincoln's election and we got the Emancipation Proclamation. Today, we have a president in the White House, who seems to be hell bent on turning the clock back to pre-1860 if he gets his way. And that is an indication that you've just uh, talked about. This president has no plans of vacating uh, the White House. He's trying to cause as much confusion as he can possibly cause in order to raise as many questions around this election that he can possibly raise in order uh, to declare some state of an emergency and not allow these elections uh, to go forward. Now, when I started saying that about uh, two and a half years ago, uh, a lot of people uh, chastised me severely. Yeah. Now they are saying uh, almost the exact same thing because Maya Angelou told us, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. This president has shown us who he is and he befeels of himself uh, to be an autocrat and he does not plan to give up the office. So I'm saying to people, November 3rd is election day, but October should be election month. Oh, the states in this union allow some form of early voting. In South Carolina, we start on October 5th. Mm -hmm. Vote absentee for any reason you wish to early. I'm asking people to vote in person absentee because we know what they're doing with the mail. He's disrupting uh, the post of service. We don't have any idea how long the mail will take to get here. Part of his plan is to have more votes than anybody else on election night and declare victory and then classify any vote that comes in by mail as being fraudulent. Mm. So I'm asking people to vote early in person so your vote can count on the night of the election. Now, if for some reason you can't get there, yes, go ahead and use the mail. But if you have any way to vote, Without using the mail, please do so in person. And Congressman, you made a good point. You talked about the significance of the election in 1860. Let's move forward 105 years to 1965. That's when the Voting Rights Act was passed to remove barriers that prevented African Americans from voting. Now, 55 years after the passage of that Voting Rights Act, our nation continues to struggle with the fundamental pillar of democracy, the right to vote. Now, you played an instrumental role in renaming the 2019 Voting Rights Advancement Act in honor of the late Representative John Lewis, your colleague. Uh, can you tell us why that is so still needed in the 21st century? Uh, because there's still voter suppression going on. If you remember what happened, as soon as the Supreme Court came out with that Shelby uh, case, Shelby v. Holden, about Shelby County, Alabama, states all over the South, South Carolina led the way. 
throwing out uh, voter uh, efforts that have been going on for years, putting in place uh, voter ID laws and other kinds of obstacles to voting. So the Voter Rights Act is still needed. Now, what had happened is that the uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court told us uh, that it may still be needed. We needed to update the formula. So Marsha Fudge went out, held hearings all over the country, and came up with a new formula. And we introduced that as the Voter Rights, Rights uh, Advancement Act. Terry Stoll, there was a lead uh, person uh, on that, but John Lewis worked with uh, Jim Sensenbrenner, uh, a Republican from Wisconsin, to put that in place. So when John passed, I went back before the House and asked them to rename the bill in his honor, uh, which they did unanimously. That law is still needed because voter suppression is still taking place. Now, we just came out of court in South Carolina uh, because they said you can vote uh, early absentee, but you got to have a witness to your signature. Hmm. And that in and of itself uh, it, it is suppressing. So uh, the, we won the case, but now they're appealing it to the Fourth Circuit. They're trying everything they can to tamp down voter participation. So as we've done before, we can't give up on that. John Lewis did not give up after going across that bridge uh, in right. March 1965, and we can't give up now. And Congresswoman, we will vote for president on November 3rd, but there are other key races on the ballot in many battleground states like South Carolina, Georgia, and Kentucky, especially on the Senate side. You know, what are the consequences of people not voting or not voting down ballot? Talk to us about the significance of not just voting for president, but for other key offices, especially federal offices. One of the things I often say, and I'm not being flippant when I say this, when I hear people tell me I do not vote until there is a presidential election, and I've had people to tell me that. And I say to them all the time, no president has ever been to your school board meeting. And your school board meeting is very important for you, your children, and your grandchildren. So you ought to be voting for the school board. You ought to be voting for city and county councils, your state legislatures. They are the ones who decide whether or not you, what the congressional lines are. And please vote for the congressional races just because I'm running for Congress, but I want you to vote for the United States Senate races. If you're in South Carolina, Jimmy Harrison can win. He is tied in the polls right now, 48 to 48. When have you ever seen an incumbent United States Senator this close to re-election and he's still under 50%? That is because people are a little bit sick of Lindsey Graham. They are looking for an alternative. They have found it in Jimmy Harrison. Jimmy can win this race, but only if people vote. So vote early and vote all down the line. From the president right on down uh, to the school board. And Congressman, the recent death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg also should remind people of the significance of getting out to vote because of course, the president gets to select who they want on the Supreme Court. Talk about the significance of where we are now, particularly if the, pre if the, if the Senate doesn't wait until a president is elected in November and a person is selected for the court before the election. Well, we're getting a real good lesson in how important it is for us uh, to elect people who are in tune with our dreams and aspirations because we now have got a Senate saying to us they're going to put up the name uh, that the president gives them and I can tell you this whoever he puts up he says it's going to be a woman she will be against a woman's right to choose she's going to be against the Voting Rights Act and she has already declared herself that uh, I'm told uh, to be in favor of whatever this president is in favor of. And one of those things is to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare. 
Uh, he is making clear that whoever he punched will be against all three of those things. Think of how you fit into that. Yeah. Do you feel a woman should have the right to choose? Do you feel that you ought not be discriminated against just because you're a woman? And that's what was able, they were able to do before we got uh, the Affordable Care Act. Do you think we need to have a Voting Rights Act? He's going to put up somebody who will vote against all three of those things. So we got to remember, elections have consequences. And I say to people, I used to teach history. I tell my students all the time, anything that's happened before can happen again. We had Reconstruction for 12 years. And after 12 years, Reconstruction came to an end by one vote. One vote is how Jim Crow got in there to our lives. Brother B. Hayes became president of the United States of America by one vote and got rid of the Reconstruction uh, era, started us on the Jim Crow. So everybody's vote counts. And we have got to remember every election will have consequences. I'm afraid if we do not do what we need to do between now and November 3rd, because they've already started voting in North Carolina, they got their ballots a week and a half ago. If we do not win this election, I believe we will see the clock get turned back and our children and grandchildren will live some of the experiences we thought were behind us. Congressman, America has witnessed massive and sustained protests calling for sweeping infrastructure changes following the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. What, what's your view? Are people of color taking their right to vote, you think, for granted? Or do you think, especially seeing all of the tens of thousands of people out in the street protesting across the country, are we finally realizing the collective power of when we all vote? I think some of us are, but some aren't. I think there are still people. In fact, I had uh, someone that said to me earlier today that they have a 19-year-old who says he does not see any need to vote because nothing will change. I'm glad John Lewis didn't feel that at 19. John Lewis was only 23 years old when he got beaten up on that bridge, but he never quit. We are now lionizing John Lewis. They're getting ready to put his likeness in the Capitol. His home state of Georgia, of all places, is going to send it up here. Mayor McLeod Bethune, she didn't give up. Uh, she was a dollar and 82 cents. Uh, she went down to Florida and found Bethune Cookman College because she didn't give up. Now, Florida is getting ready to send her likeness up here, taking their Confederate general out and putting her statue in, in the Capitol. This is what happens when you stay engaged. If John Lewis were here tonight with me, he would say to each and every one of you, don't give up, don't give in, and don't give out. Keep your eyes on the prize. So I know that people are energized. But we got to turn that energy into movement. So just because we're energized won't get us there. We got to go out and vote. Because if we don't vote in this election, I am afraid of what the future of this country is going to be like. And I just tell people all the time we have to learn the lessons of history. Because as George Santiano once said to us, if we don't learn the lessons of history, we are bound to repeat them. Hopefully we have learned. But the fact of the matter is, I'll never know until November 4th, the day after this election, whether or not we really learned. And Congressman, before I let you go, one final question. You've already given us your view of what you think America will look like if our people don't come out and exercise their right to vote. And it sounds so discouraging. However, what would you say to people who are constantly bombarded in the media? What would you say about disinformation campaigns and for how, for how people can stay aware of what is true and what is real and how to get the facts? I say to people all the time, don't wrestle with whether or not this stuff is true. 
Just remember, nobody who looks like me will ever do anything detrimental to his children or his grandchildren. And that is what I will be doing if I did not keep faith with people of color. I've got four grandchildren. I don't want them to relive what I lived. My parents made significant sacrifices for me and I will make it for them. So when these Russian trolls or uh, China trolls or even these American trolls start putting yeah. stuff out there on the internet, just remember, if you don't know the source, don't repeat it and don't believe it. I've been telling everybody, I'm an Omega, but Kamala Harris is an AKA. I'm an AKA until November 4th. I'm not putting all this stuff aside. I'm a proud graduate of South Carolina State University. Yes. Bulldogs. Yes. But between yes. now and November 4th, I'm a Howard University Bison because I am with Kamala Harris every step of the way. And I'm doing nothing that will in any way take away from whatever I can commit to making her Vice President of the United States of America, and then my good friend Joe Biden can come along for the ride. Congressman Clyburn, we can't thank you enough for all of your wisdom and for your energy and for really encouraging us to do the right thing and that is exercise our right to vote on November the 3rd and every election, not just November the 3rd, but start now if you haven't started. And for those of you who do vote, continue to vote. Thank you, sir. Keep up the good work in Congress and we appreciate you joining us here this evening. Thank you very much for having me. Hello, I'm Van Johnson, the 67th mayor of the mother city of Georgia, Savannah. It is so imperative that right now we are singularly focused on voting. I want to thank the links for including us in your town hall meeting to remind people that it's our responsibility, it's our privilege, but it's our duty to get together, to galvanize people, to get them out to vote. So much rise on this election right here, right now. We have work to do, not only at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, but in courthouses and state houses across this nation. Join with me, link up with your friends across the country. Make sure you vote. Hello, I'm Steve Benjamin. 10 years ago, I had the honor of being elected the first African-American mayor of Columbia, South Carolina. I was elected based on the blood, sweat, and tears of so many who came before us and sacrificed all to ensure that we'd have the right to vote. Now that battle is ours. In 2020, we will face the most consequential election in our lives. And it's up to us to honor the sacrifices made and more importantly, to ensure that the promise of America extends to generations yet unborn. Let's do this. Let's get out and vote in record numbers. God bless you. Our next guest is the president and senior lecturer of Repairers of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. He has pastored Greenleaf Christian Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina since 1993, and he's been an activist since a child when he helped to desegregate the public school system when he was only in kindergarten. No stranger to activism and deeply rooted in faith, we welcome Bishop William Barber to our live town hall meeting tonight. Welcome, Bishop. Barbara, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And I'm glad to be with my dear Link Sixters tonight. And uh, on behalf of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, uh, more than 40, representing more than 43 states and over 200 partners, I'm glad to join with you tonight. And uh, Bishop Barber, it, it's serious time now. We're 40 days away from the election. And we've heard the, t the term souls to the polls as a campaign aimed at getting believers and maybe even some non-believers to cast their ballots. Talk a little bit more about why this is just so significant this year for the faith community to get involved in getting people out to vote. 
Well, certainly, you know, we had over 3 million people to join with us uh, for the mass Poor People's Assembly Moral March on Washington a Digital Affair. The Lynx was a partner to that in, in June. And just a few weeks ago, we had a million people, 1.2 million people to join us for a Voting is Power Unleashed. And, you know, first of all, we must understand voting is a theological issue. Uh, the, the Jewish people tell us in Hebrew, the word for voice and vote is the same word. It's call, Q-U-K-U-L. But we also know that anytime somebody tries to suppress your vote, they're trying to suppress your humanity uh, because we only allow people to vote. We don't allow pets, parakeets, and puppies. So if I suggest, if I try to suppress your vote, I'm suggesting you're not human. I'm suggesting that you don't have the same rights that I have as a human being. And and I and I believe that um, you you can be diminished. Now, having said that, we as people of faith, whether it be Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Sikh, Hindu, uh, because black people represent all of those areas, we need to vote issues and not just personality. And we need to understand that there are five moral issues that we ought to focus on: systemic racism in all of its format, uh, of, of all of its forms, systemic poverty. Uh, ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism and white evangelicalism. We have to vote because right now, before COVID, there are 140 million poor and low-wealth people in this country. After COVID, it's going up immensely, and we may be as high as over 60% 60 of the people in this country who are poor and low-wealth. We got 62 million people that work every day for less than a living wage. We had 87 million people without health care, underinsured, uh, or it should before COVID, now we have 114 million because we've added 27 million for people who've lost their jobs uh, and therefore their health care because their health care was connected to their job and not to their body. And we have a current administration that wants to roll back health care. Uh, they, they want to continue to suppress voter suppress, uh, the voter. I don't know if you all know, this is a matter of history. Uh, Senator McConnell has blocked fixing the Voting Rights Act for over 2,600 days, not 2,600 hours, not 26 hours, but 2,600 days. Uh, they have blocked voting for uh, $15 in a union, which would lift 62 million people out of poverty and 54% of all African-Americans make less than living wage. So we are literally voting for issues and voting for life. Yes, we're voting to address police brutality, but we're also voting against necropolitics, the politics of death where people die, because we don't deal with COVID, right? They die because mm -hmm. they don't have health care. They die because they're in poverty. 700 people were dying a day before COVID from poverty and low wealth. So we have to vote our lives. We have to vote to live. And those are theological matters. And that's what should be driving uh, people to the polls. And, and Bishop Barber, thank you for that. I do want to encourage people who are watching us live on Facebook and YouTube to please solicit your questions. We'll be on with Bishop Barber for the next 15, possibly 20 minutes, if he can spare us the time. And, and Bishop, you talk about this COVID environment. Now that we are in this environment, that means that churches are closed. So you don't have the, the parishioners going back into the churches. They're watching online, those who can watch online. What role can churches play in encouraging their congregations to exercise their right to vote as their civic duty even when the church doors are closed right now. And also a lot of churches have been instrumental in the past in using, um, getting people to the polls. How do you encourage people not to drop those missions in this COVID environment? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I like to say the building is closed, the church never closed. Mm -hmm. And so then I like to say, well, what did we do in slavery? I mean, we had an underground railroad in the midst of slavery uh, and we couldn't meet in a building. So we need to pick up those old ways of understanding this. I mean, COVID has exposed the fissures of, of racism and poverty, uh, and, and it has exposed that uh, racism and poverty and the disparities created by both of them are matters of national security. Uh, what we need to do now is number one, inform people about every way you can vote early and encourage people to do that, whether it's early voting in person or mailing in. We don't need to believe the lies coming out of the White House, coming out of other uh, places of society. Uh, if you go to vote in person, we need to gird up, we need to put on gloves, we need to put on masks. We need to stay six feet, 10 feet apart. Uh, we need to follow the protocols for social distancing. What we can't do is stay home. 
what we can't do is use it as an excuse. Now, now I, I want to say something here that, that may be a little controversial, but people need to hear it. Number one is, you know, we keep saying, for instance, a candidate might have gotten 90 percent of the black vote last time. That's 90 percent of the people who voted. There were millions of folks that didn't vote. 100 million people didn't vote in the last election. 100 million people. Uh, 64 million poor and low-wealth people who were eligible to vote. 34 million didn't vote. 29 million did. You know, we, we had we we have a lot of people that even when President Obama was running, millions of people that looked like us stayed home. If everybody that said they voted for Obama voted for Obama, he wouldn't have had any close races. So we just got to tell the truth. There were things we didn't do when we had we didn't have COVID, and now we see what that cost. We have somebody in office right now who won, did not win the popular vote. That's only happened four times in American history and all, all four times it turned out bad. And, and where, they, where, where they did win, uh, Trump won 80,000 votes in three states from Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Uh, 2.6 million poor and low wealth people in those states did not vote. They were already eligible, already registered to vote. So, so, so that's one issue. But the other issue is the, the politicians that want to vote have got to stop just talking about middle class and wealth. They've got to talk about poor, low wealth people. We just did a study called Voting is Power Unleashed. And it says four reasons why poor, low wealth people have not have not voted. And that's black, white. It doesn't matter. Number one is issues. Too many politicians play. They don't talk about poverty. They don't talk about policies that address poverty. People don't hear their names. Number two, transportation, time off from their job. And number three, voter suppression. We, we can fix at least a couple of those and we can overcome the latter one, but it's going to require people. That's why two weeks ago we invited Trump and Biden to come on a, a platform. Trump didn't, but over a million people tuned in and Vice President Biden talked about poverty and dealing with poverty as being a his 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 philosophy of a change. People need to hear that. They need to understand the difference it will make in their lives, in this their lives. And then lastly, we need to understand, and this is gonna sound funny, um, uh, Melena, but let me say it and then, 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 then hear it. We don't need folk to just vote. I disagree with some politicians say just vote. Because in this culture, you can win the popular vote and lose the electoral college. We right. need folk to vote and then vote strategically. Now that means we have to have massive turnout in 15 states. 15 states from Michigan, but then also from Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, mm -hmm. Alabama, Mississippi, the South, where if black poor, if poor people vote anywhere between 1 and 19 percent higher than they did last time, in most of those states is under 19 percent, they can fundamentally change the electorate. And, that, and, and from Maryland to New Mexico, is 193 electoral college votes, 60 members of the United States Senate. So anybody that's not talking about mobilizing votes in the South does not understand the battle we're at really in. The least populated states now control the Senate and control the Supreme Court. Why? Because too often progressives don't fight in the South. We don't mobilize strategically. So we need to vote, but we need to mobilize strategically. Mike Epsi, last, last I want to say Mike Epsi, in Mississippi, running for the Senate, just got announced that he's only about a half a point down. In Mississippi, in Mississippi, you talk about Black Lives Matter, what would it mean, do to us to have an African-American man elected to the United States from Mississippi to change the balance of power? But too often, people don't talk about those states. They just give them up. We can't give them up anymore. Bishop Barber, you talked about the 100 million people who did not vote in the last presidential election. Well, let's go back to March of this year when COVID hit, the effect it's had on the economy, which has thrown millions of people out of jobs, which means now we're going to be adding to the number of people who will be homeless, without jobs, uh, and, and, and poor again. And for those who may end up homeless or are, have ended up homeless, how do they go about not losing hope and making it to the polls, meaning their address has changed? Yeah. But that doesn't mean they still can't vote. So let, let's address that issue for the people who find themselves in that position. Well, I'm going to fuss a little bit. <laughs> you know, I think, the, I think the, first of all, the, the CARES Act that was passed in March 
I don't think Democrats fought hard enough. Now, they're going to be mad because I said that, but that's all right, because 83 percent of that money ended up going to banks and corporations. And even when we had that conversation, we did not talk a lot about poverty and low wealth, which is the issue that people are facing. We have to be able to say if you vote, it's going to make a fundamental difference um, and, and to poor and low wealth people. Because remember, of that hundred million, 64 million are poor and low wealth. One third of the electorate is now poor and low wealth. So if you're not talking to poor and low wealth people, that's economic suicide. And 60, I mean, a political suicide. And 61 percent of all black people are poor and low wealth. That's 26 million people. 31% of, of white people are poor and low wealth. That's 66 million people. Dr. King said the only group that could fundamentally shift the American architecture, the political landscape, would be for poor blacks, poor whites, labor, and, and indigenous people and Latinos to come together. That's what we must call people to. So in a real sense, then we must say to people, listen, why are you facing evictions now? Because people who got elected did not guarantee rent forgiveness and mortgage forgiveness for long enough. Why, why are the stimulus checks being cut off now? Because ele people elected in the office have refused to extend the stimulus. They would rather vote to fill a Supreme Court seat and steal it than to vote for a stimulus. We have to make the connection between life and death. So we are voting for our lives. So remember in South Africa, when those people first got the vote and the lines were everywhere. I mean, they were long. Yes. We yes. need that kind of moment now. This is the rebirthing of America. We have to treat this like this. Somebody has tried to take something from us, our votes and our lives. And that means that if if I'm headed toward homelessness, I'm not going to pass by voting. If I don't have a stimulus check, I'm sure going to be angry enough to vote because I understand that the reason those things, the reason wealthy people have made over $300 billion since March during, during COVID. And poor and low wealth people and working people have not received the stimulus they need is because of public policy, the decision, which is, and lastly, I wanna give a shout out to the politicians that may be listening, which is why black politicians who are in so-called safe districts, who don't have competition, must act like they have competition. They must run like they have competition. And we must say to, to parties that want our vote, you need to speak to folk and let them know if we get elected in the first, not 100 days, 50 days, because see, we're already under depression. We're headed toward a great destruction. And there's going to have to be major actions taken in the first 50 days. People need to hear that. Vote, and I'm going to get health care. Vote, and, 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 and I'm going to get rent forgiveness. Vote. And I want to get the stimulus and the PPEs and the sick leave and the right kind of vaccines. Vote and, and voting rights is going to be restored. Vote. And I'm going to not only protect the Affordable Care Act, but expand health care, expand health care in the richest nation in the world. If people hear that and they connect the vote to living, I guarantee you the vote will come alive. And, and lastly, with if this, if this uh, extremist Senate forces this seat, a uh, uh, vote on this seat, and they win it. After they had lied and said they couldn't do it when Obama was president and so forth and so on, if they do that, then the response to that must be a voter turnout. It ought to be anyway. But we got to remember Ruth, remember Brianna, remember all the folk died from COVID. That needs to be the biggest turnout of the vote we have ever seen. Uh, that's what has to happen in the most. The death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The death of all these people that died from COVID unnecessarily, 60%, yes. some say. And the death of Brianna, the death of, of, of George, the death of so many names we can't even remember must cause us to come to life, come to life. And, and if that's in our gut and that's in our heart, we can deal with COVID. We can find a way. We can put that mask on and put those gloves on and yeah. wash our hands with, with warm water and so forth and so on and put a ham sandwich in a cellophane bag or a chicken sandwich if you don't do ham and we can put some water in the bag. We can do, we know how to do this. We have to decide we have to do this because it literally is a matter of life and death and politicians need to know they need to be talking like that so the people are inspired. 
And Bishop uh, Barber, we're starting to get some questions from the audience. I'm going to read this. One question is, do you think that the black church leaders are doing enough to remind our community of what's at stake in the upcoming election? Or have we just decided to stay home to ensure our safety? Well, this is where I would ask this question. Wherever you are, are the leaders talking about poverty and low wealth? Were they talking about it before COVID? How can you be a black leader and 61% of your people are poor and low wealthy? That's not a that's, that's not the major issue on your mind. Uh, are the leaders around you talking about universal health care? Uh, are they talking about living wages? Are they talking about how if, if, if you pay people $15 a union right now, 49 million people would immediately come up out of poverty and we would pump $368 billion into the economy? Uh, ask the politicians, even the black ones, are you taking money from the pharmaceuticals? Or are you fighting for health care? I mean, we this is a time we talk about reckoning. Reckoning has to be across the board. You know, we, you don't get a, a pass because you got a black face in a high place. We just saw a black face in a high place lie yesterday in Kentucky and, and, and refused to prosecute folk that shot one of our daughters in the chest and said that the grand jury had found the truth. Grand jurors don't find truth. Grand jurors just find out whether there needs to be an indictment. And so you, you don't get a pass. You know, you don't, one sermon is not enough. One politician saying vote. What's your record? What have you done? What are you talking about? And I'm I'm really serious about this. I, I don't believe I've done enough. We got to not do a lot. I think we have to do more. I think more is required. We got to do more with more because our foreparents did more with less. But, but, but particularly those of us that hold positions of leadership, sound the alarm, get on Instagram, get on video, uh, um, use all of the tools. Uh, that we find, we're finding a way to raise money for our church to find a way to get people out to the polls. Elected black politicians, I don't care if you don't have anybody running against you. You need to be running like you got everybody against you. I heard a black politician say the other day, well, I'm going to win anyhow. And I said, that's a shameful way to talk. You need to be running, even if you're in a district, you need to be running to increase the at large. <laughs> you know, so we all need to recognize this is my and the other thing we need like we're seeing with black lives matter like we saw with the abolition movement in the 1800s the civil rights movement we need to hook up we can't do this black alone we need black and white and brown and red and yellow and gay and straight and young and old and west coast and east coast we need a fusion coalition of all people i was just with the apache nation today or the Apache Nation. We need everybody. I was with people, white folk in Appalachia that are just as upset about uh, racism and voter suppression as black people. We need everybody. The movements that have made a difference in this country have always been fusion movement where people came together across color lines to vote for a more perfect union and to make this a more genuine democracy. And Bishop Barber, one final question for you. I happen to be in on your Facebook Live a program, the Poor People's Campaign, the other week. And one of the things you said was we have to shift the narrative, but you can't do that without shifting the narrator. Explain what that quote means and what happens after the balance of power shifts. Yeah, that means that we have to, when I say 61% of black people are poor and no wealth, we need to have poor and no wealth black people talking, not just people talking for them. If we have 114 million people who don't have health care, we need people who are suffering from that to get on these live streams, get on uh, Instagram, get on videos and say, listen, I'm going to vote. I need you to vote for me and vote for these issues. We have to change the narrative. Right now, the narrative is if you help the middle class, it fixes everything for everybody. That's not true. The other narrative is if you trickle down from the wealthy, that thing, that's not true. The other narrative is we don't have the money. Well, we know that's a lie now because uh, Mnuchin and others found $1.23 trillion without even going through the Congress. Uh, and, and two or three months before COVID, we were being told we didn't have any money. We'd have to raise taxes to do health care. But all of a sudden in COVID, we could find three, four trillion dollars for corporations and banks. So we have to challenge these lies and these mythologies, and we have to put a face, a face on these problems. We have to show the pain. But then the other part is we have to show what's possible, not what just what's wrong. Imagine what would be possible if, if really 90, 98% of the black vote turned out. I'm not talking about 98% of black folk vote for a certain candidate who vote. That's, that's a different number. 
because that might mean only 60% of black folk voted, but 98 of the 60% voted for candidate. What if 98% of us voted in this time? What if 98% of us voted for life? And what if we hooked up with, with progressive whites and brown people and we, we, and we were voting for issues, not just for personality? What kind of America could we be? Could, couldn't we be better? Couldn't we be better coming out of all this racism and hatred? On the other side of it, if we vote and then stay engaged and put, we could be a nation where health care is for all. We could be a nation where we fully restore the Voting Rights Act. We could be a nation where we address poverty. And we, it could be a nation where we fully fund health uh, education and fully fund HBCUs and, 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 and end student debt. These are not impossible things. We have to remember 100 years ago, folks said Social Security was impossible and Medicaid and Medicaid uh, was impossible and, and civil rights was impossible and voting rights was impossible. But 100 years later, those things that were said uh, that were impossible then uh, have not only been made possible, but they're real today. So we must decide in our time, what are the things we must believe can be possible and must become possible if America is going to be a genuine democracy. We are in tribulation, but could this also be a moment of transformation? We're in tribulation, but could this often be a moment of transition? I'm a preacher and everywhere in the Bible I read where there's a plague, a virus, it comes, it grows up when there's bad leadership. But on the mm -hmm. other side, when the people get committed to stand and the commit people become closer to justice and love, on the other side of the plague is transition, is transformation, is, is a restructuring and a reordering of society. I believe that possibility is with us now. Is it going to be easy? No. Are we going to have to fight? Yes. Is there, is there gobs and gobs of money against us? And, and is the opposition organized? They are organized extremely well. But as Frederick Douglass said in 1857, opposition that's organized like it is against the anti-slavery movement always seems invincible until it falls, until the moment it falls. And so what should happen now, as Douglass said, I say to us tonight, every all of these attempts to undermine this democracy and to literally take our lives and our families' lives should only serve to embolden and intensify our agitation at the ballot box, in the streets, in the pulpits, in the sweeps, suites, and everywhere we go. It's time for us to rise. It's not just time for us to be woke. Be, we gotta be woke and then take the next step, get out of bed. So you can be woke and still in bed. It's not the rising, it's, the, it's not the waking, it's the rising, the song says. We gotta be awoke and then we gotta get up. And yes, COVID is there, but we can take care of COVID and be safe because we got these other viruses of racism and poverty and evil that are also destructive and we must take it on and we must take it on now. And how we vote is a sign and a symbol as whether or not we are serious about making this democracy what it ought to be. Bishop Barber, thank you so much. We can't thank you enough for being that voice in the wilderness, always crying out and reminding us of what we need to do. The time is now, we cannot wait. Thank you again for joining us this evening, and we appreciate you, and uh, best of luck to everything also with the Poor People's Campaign. Love you to the links, and thank you for your partnership. God bless. <laughs> thank you, sir. We have seen a dramatic impact on our opportunities throughout this country because of the right to vote. The right to vote allowed me to become the first black probate judge which serves as the chief election official in Montgomery County, Alabama in 2012. I won by only 3,000 votes out of 100,000 cast. Shortly after that, I became the first black mayor of the city of Montgomery in its 200 year history. Without people coming out to vote, not only would I not be here, but many of the things that we fought for and we continue to do as part of our administration, and our agenda, probably would not have been implemented. Many of you know just how important it is at the local, state, and national level for everyone to vote. I'm Alvin Brown. I'm the first African-American mayor of the city of Jacksonville, Florida, the 12th largest city in the country. Voting is so important, and we are encouraging you to go out and vote. Why? Because education is on the ballot. Health care is on the ballot. Jobs are on the ballot. I got elected by 1,600 votes. I'm a testament that your vote does count.
Welcome back in for this final segment, and I'm excited to welcome our final guest of the night who absolutely needs no introduction. He's a native of Houston, Texas, a CNN contributor, author, internet talk show host. Y'all know him, Roland Martin. Roland, welcome to our broadcast tonight. Thank you for joining us. And I can't, Roland, I think you need to unmute. I can't hear you. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us. I wanna start this conversation out by looking at the media's role in our democracy when it comes to getting out the vote. What is the media doing right? What is the media doing wrong? Roland, I think you're still on mute. We can't hear you. And see, I can't hear Roland now. I don't know if what's going on with the audio. Okay, we'll try to get back with Roland in, in just a moment. At this time now, we're gonna go to uh, Dr. Deborah Thomas, who is the Southern Area Program Chair, to give us some more information on voting, the, area, the Southern Area of the Link's involvement in voting. And Deborah, and if you can take yourself off mute, I, I see you're muted as well. Yes, I am. And thank you very much, Melina. In terms of voting, our chapters are very much engaged with voter mobilization through our partnerships with the NAACP and with When We All Vote. We are able to register citizens and we're also looking at the virtual space by which we engage citizens through education, uh, more awareness regarding what happens when we vote and why we should vote. And thank you so much, Deborah, for telling us. And then we have some tools and some information for folks as well on how we want to continue to keep them engaged in voting and not only going to vote, but taking family members and friends and neighbors with you to ensure that we get the vote out because of the collective power of when we all vote. Absolutely. Uh, later in the program, we will reference the voters education and engagement guide that is available on our Southern area website. We are very excited that our program development team through our legislative issues, public affairs and disaster relief committee has developed a tool that can be a powerful vehicle through which we can support our communities in understanding more about the power to vote, uh, vehicles through which they can register and share the information with communities through faith uh, communities, as well as neighborhoods, nonprofit organizations, as well as educational institutions. And thank you so much, Deborah. That is good information. And of course, we just want to remind everybody that we absolutely cannot take this election or any election for granted. It is so important to get people out to the polls registered if you haven't registered. And remember to go to the website of the state that you live in because voter registration uh, will end um, in most states by the first week in October in order to be registered to vote for the November election. I'm going to check back in one more time. Do we have Roland at this point? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Roland. Thank you All so right. much for so, joining us. So to answer your first question, uh, it's simple. Uh, the media's responsibility is uh, not to get out the vote, votes, but actually to uh, accurately uh, cover uh, the races. So one of the issues uh, is, is simple, and that is uh, he does not do a good job when it comes to covering voter suppression. It's often covered too late. 
uh, back in 2013 when I got uh, the Journalist of the Year for the National Association of Black Journalists, uh, is because we focused on it for a whole year. Uh, we understood uh, how important it was. And so typically what happens is these media outlets, they'll focus on it, you know, in October. Well, hell, we already got past the registration deadline. Uh, folks are already in early voting and you know, all those things are happening. And so uh, I think what has to happen is also being honest and clear. I mean, when you have uh, right now uh, Donald Trump and Republicans who are doing everything they can to stop folks from voting, uh, there has to be vigorous uh, reporting. Uh, on that. You look at Louisiana, where the Secretary of State mysteriously takes down the voter registration portal on National Voter Registration Day. So really, so so it's not it's going to be up until midnight, uh, w w midnight Wednesday. So here you have a big push for National Voter Registration Day, but in Louisiana, it's automatic. It, all of a sudden, it's down. When you look at what's happening, the A. Philip Randolph Institute, uh, of course, uh, suing the folks in Ohio, uh, where they um, uh, call for uh, increasing drop boxes. And then what does the Secretary of State of Ohio do? He then calls a voter fraud specialist with the Heritage Foundation. Doesn't, doesn't respond to the A. Philip Randolph Institute, but he calls his voter fraud specialist. And so we have to understand uh, the kind of tactics that are being deployed to keep folks uh, from voting. A federal judge ruled uh, because of COVID, they did not need the witness requirement to cash your absentee vote ballot in South Carolina. Well, today, the conservative Fourth Circuit uh, Court uh, over, overruled that particular judge. Now you need a witness. And so we have to realize that there are extremely sophisticated ways that are being put in place to keep us from voting, to frustrate people, to force them to give up. And so we just got to jump over those hurdles. And, and Roland, you have a huge platform and a lot of followers. And I know that you are constantly out there reminding people of what they need to do. And you're keeping all these issues Every out day. in the forefront. But what, what do you say to voters? And I hear this a lot, too. And I'm a journalist as well. That people will say, well, it doesn't matter. My vote won't count. You know, I don't <laughs> understand the issue. I mean, how do you combat that as a voice in the media? You combat stupidity with knowledge. And you tell people, but see, the part of the problem is that we don't make it plain to people. You have to make it plain. You have to actually walk people through this whole deal. So when somebody says, oh, this doesn't matter, you say, okay, fine. What, what are the top two or three important issues that you have, you care about? Then when they tell you, then you say, well, you do know how politics is involved in this. The reality is this here. Um, when people say, you know, well, we need to get government out of our lives, that doesn't even exist. It's just, it's just an idiotic statement. Here's the reality. The moment you are born, your birth certificate is a government document. You get married, that's a government document. You get divorced, it's a government document. I mean, you gotta file, you gotta actually file papers with the with the court. When you get when you die, that's a government document. Baby's born, government document. So government plays a role in everything. So, but we have to do is connect the dots. Get people to understand that if you care about this issue here, this is how the mayor, the city council, the state rep, the state senator, the governor, the U.S. senator, the member of Congress, the president all impact that very issue. And so that's one of the things that I do, walk people through. Uh, tonight's show, I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to explain to people why uh, if you vote for Biden, you're not going to get the same federal judges you're going to get from Trump and walking them through what those rulings have been from far right wing conservative federal judges today. Uh, Mitch McConnell confirmed the 218th federal judge of Donald Trump. 88% uh, of those federal judges are white men between the ages of 35 and 45. Their desire is to control the federal bench for the next 30 to 50 years. That's why they're so focused on the courts. But then I had to explain to the audience how we were able to achieve civil rights. That didn't come just because of the Voting Rights Act of 65 or the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Fair Housing Act of 68. It was because the courts enforced the law. So you have to link those two. You're doing the, the good job and the right job. But Roland, we also see, and it started four years ago, this disinformation campaign of attack the media, attack the media so yep. that you don't believe the media. How do you get around that? Because this has been an ongoing campaign now for four years. Of course. And some people are, are, are almost going tone deaf to what's true, what's real. What and then that? you have to well, combat the internet that you have information out there right. by Russian bots and others. So, so, so this, that attack on media has not been happening 
for, for four years has really been happening for the last uh, 45, 50 years. That is a tactic that the right uses. The Media Research Center, Brent Bozell, those folks, uh, that's what they do. And so the whole point is to sow seeds of discontent. But it's real yeah. simple. You fight that with information. And so when somebody says, OK, well, I don't believe that," you say, fine, bring me, bring, bring me the truth. Br bring me the facts. And so my whole deal is we're not going to actually debate facts. We can debate opinion. We can debate perspective. We can debate analysis. We're not going to debate facts. And so part of the problem is people not willing uh, to actually engage with people in a very rigorous way on fact. And so when that is your modus operandi, then that's what matters. And I think so part of the problem has been people not really understanding uh, how to fight it. And so folks want to get all emotional. My whole deal is like, no, no, no. And so here's a big piece. And I've always had this in my entire career. Whether I have my radio show on WVON radio in Chicago, whether it's I'm on television, when, when I was on CNN, when I was on TV one, you cannot come on my show and lie. And folks go, well, why do you interrupt? Because you're lying. If you if, see, here's what the media does. You'll watch CNN, you'll watch these networks and they'll have somebody on, they're lying. They let them continue. Well, I, I want to be rude. No, I can't let you continue to lie because the audience is believing the lies. If I don't, if I don't correct you, then the audience goes, "My must be true." Roll didn't say anything, and so for me, the moment you lie, I'm shutting you down. I'm, I'm gonna say, "No, no, no." I'm gonna let you continue, but we're gonna correct that lie. That has to. You have to be vigilant in saying we are not going to allow lies to stand. That's what it has to be. You know, uh, you talk about mainstream media and about 70, 75 years ago when the black media was strong, when you had a lot of black newspapers around the country and black radio stations. And now those voices are almost gone. Thank goodness people like you are still out there. What do we need to do as people not only to vote with our pocket, but also but to to encourage and support African-American media. Well, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, look, we created, uh, we launched this show two years ago. Uh, folks said, oh, you know, there's no way you're gonna be successful with this digital show. I mean, we did 9.3 million views our first month. We did 30 million views last month. Uh, grew the YouTube channel from 157,000 YouTube subscribers, 625,000 today. Uh, and so what that's been about is being able is understanding that this is the information that we're presenting. What, what 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 the audience has to do is, and again, we've had look. My faithful followers have been there. Uh, my first uh, I, my first check for our fan club came from a 92 year old black woman in Long Island, New York, who said, "I watched you on TV One. But your voice is so important. My daughter told me about your digital show. I'm supporting your digital show." She includes she included a 500 dollar check. Uh, told totally totally blew me away. Uh, and so uh, it's it's it, it's simply support, but it's not just. Individual donations, which, you know, people can for us, they can give cash app, PayPal, Venmo, Square, go to RollerMarkUnfilter.com. But it also they've got to challenge the companies they work for. They've got to say to these companies, are you using black ad agencies? Are you buying black media, black owned media? Because let's be real clear. Not all black media is black owned media. OK, sure. That's fine. You can you can you can support BET, but Viacom on Viacom, CBS owns BET. All right. That's not black owned media. And so we've got to have African-Americans in companies willing to challenge the companies to say, where's our ad budget going? Are we not spending dollars with black consumers uh, or we're not spending dollars with black owned media? That's what also has to happen to ensure those dollars. The federal government spends five billion dollars a year on advertising and black owned media gets thirty five million. If black owned media got 15 percent of the money spent by the federal government alone, we would go from 35 million to 750 million. That is a huge gap. That then allows us to build capacity, hire more staff, uh, for us to be able to grow the brand, to market, do all those different things. But the way the ad dollars are constructed, black media is dying on the vine, getting not even crumbs, because that's what they tailor towards us. And then that's how you change it. And so that takes us back to voting. It's important to vote, not just for the president, not just for Senate, yep. but all offices in order to make sure we get people in there who are voting our interests. So final question to you, Roland, 
you reach millions of people. 40 days left now into the election. What What's your plan? What, I know you have one. What are you doing from now until election day to encourage, stimulate, get people to the polls and not get to put up the gas? Well, well, up to vote? well first we drive it every day. But the first thing I want to tell how people do is to actually check your status. Go to vote.org. Go to IWillVote.com. Because I've had multiple people who have hit me up saying, thank God you pushed that issue of checking your status on your show because they had registration cards in hand, but they had been purged. And so the first thing is go to vote.org or iwillvote.com to check your registration status. If you are registered, good. Now, do you want to you request a mail-in ballot? Do you plan on voting? I'm driving people not not to be locked and loaded. If you have to vote by mail, fine. But here's a piece. We've got to walk our people through. They must follow all of the directions because Republicans are going to be hunting to throw out ballots. We see the naked ballot issue in Pennsylvania where yeah. you got to put an envelope inside of an envelope. If you don't, it's invalidated. And so we got to get our people to focus on that, how to effectively do that. And so we're just hammering that thing every single day, giving people early voting registrations day, registration day. So, for instance, every state is not the same. So you've got some states that actually have same day voter registration, some same day early voting, not the general, some not early voting the general, some you can vote. You can vote same day in early voting as well as the general election. And so we're driving that every single day uh, in order to get people focused on the election. That is great information. We can't uh, stress that enough. Roland Martin, thank you so much for all that Appreciate you do, it. all you continue to do, get that vote out. And thank you for joining us tonight. Like that TSU shirt, that's where my parents went to school. Well, I've, I've been wearing HBCU shirts all week. So I did North Carolina a and on Monday, Virginia State on Tuesday. Uh, yesterday I did a Florida Memorial. So Tennessee State was on my show tonight. So uh, having decided who I'm going to rock tomorrow. Uh, so folks have to tune in at 6 p.m. Eastern to find out. We'll be watching. Thank you so much for joining us, Roland. Appreciate we appreciate it. you on this subject. And uh, we want to thank you all again for joining us this evening. I'd like to call back uh, Dr. Deborah Thomas to come in to uh, give us some more information again, or even repeat the information she gave us before in case there were some people who missed it on the importance of getting out the vote and wrapping up this segment. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. And thank you very much. To whom much is given in the privilege of voting, the voice, the power, and the impact on change must not be taken for granted. Good evening again. Appreciation is extended to our distinguished panelists and outstanding moderator who have executed a powerful town hall this evening. As the Southern Area Program Chair, I want you to know that our program development team is responsible for providing resources and guidance to our communities on all levels and at all times. We appreciate your assisting us in meeting these deliverables even during a pandemic, hence the birth of our virtual town hall series. Our goals, through our chapters, area and national organization remain the same. To enrich each and every life that we touch. Tonight, you have heard the crucial, the rallying call to action for voter mobilization. Please visit www.salinksinc.org and use the Voters Education and Engagement Guide to mobilize the vote with well-developed plans for our chapters and in our communities. On behalf of the Southern Area of the Lynx Incorporated, we thank you for your engagement this evening and look forward to November as we all witness the collective power of when we all vote. Good night and stay safe. I'm gonna be a registered voter, oh Lord. I'm gonna be a
registered voter one of these days. Hallelujah. I'm going to be a registered voter. I'm going to be a registered voter one of these days. I'm